the highest. Hosanna to the King of Kings. Lord, <coughs> save us, the crowd cried. Now, you've got to imagine that when uh, people are shouting, save us, we don't necessarily think of that going along with uh, dancing and celebration. If someone was yelling to our first responders in this day, save us, save us, it would, be, it would have a, a, a kind of a panic and a desperation attached to it, wouldn't it? So this idea that Palm Sunday comes and Jesus comes marching into the city, riding on a donkey, and people are shouting, save us, and dancing and celebrating, kind of seems a little incongruous if you think about it. But there they were, there must have been a portion of desperation in their voice as they cried to this one who could be the Messiah. Lord, save us. Deliver us from this. Rescue us. And truly he was the one who was sent to deliver and rescue and save the people. And yet his own people did not receive him. They did not recognize him for who he was. But aren't we blessed in this day to come and have a perspective that they didn't have, to come and with celebration be able to sing Hosanna to the King of da Hosanna to the Son of David, Hosanna to the King of Kings, and proclaim that we know that this is the Messiah who will save us, deliver us from our sin, and deliver us from the darkness of this broken and fallen world. I'm going to invite you this morning with appreciation to join me in celebrating this one who has come and the beginning of this holy week when we remember the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. We do that every week, don't we? But in a special way this week, we begin a solemn and a celebrative remembrance of Jesus Christ and his work on our behalf. We're going to begin by singing hymn number 174, and I'm going to invite you to stand with me this morning as we sing. Let's lift our voices together. Hosanna.
Amen. You may be seated.
If you are a guest with us today, I want to particularly welcome you to our Palm Sunday worship. And I'd love to give you an opportunity to let us know who you are and also if there's a way that we can provide some help or information for you. When you open our bulletin, you'll notice that there's a welcome card. If you could take just a few moments to fill out some basic information and, as I said, if there's a, some information that you like about the church or your relationship with, with Jesus, um, whatever it may be, just jot, that on, uh, excuse me, jot that on that card, tear it off along the perforation, and then a little later in the service when the offering plate comes by, you can place that card into the offering plate. Of course, for anyone here, notice on the opposite side, a uh, place for prayer requests. And if you'd like to share some prayer requests with us, we, uh, I want you to know that they are shared among the uh, pastors and the elders, the leadership here at 4C, and we do pray for you. A lot of things coming up both today and throughout this week. After second service today, we have what's called 4C Connects. And if you are relatively new to 4C or um, you have not yet really made connections here at 4C and you have questions as to what 4C even is all about, I would invite you to a luncheon after second hour uh, downstairs in the fellowship hall. Um, it is free and even if you haven't RSVP'd earlier, you're still welcome to come. You have an opportunity to meet leadership and uh, ask some questions and uh, see opportunities, uh, ways maybe you can connect into a relational group. That's this afternoon after second service. And then tonight at 6 p.m. we have a congregational meeting which is not just for membership, it's for anyone here who uh, is a part of 4C and so I would encourage all of you to consider coming tonight at 6 o'clock. We'll be talking about um, certainly finances but also attendance trends and even more importantly um, where we are in uh, the status of our vision and our mission and staff reorientation. Uh, we will also, uh, the membership anyway, will be voting on a proposal to uh, make modification to our Articles of Faith and Bylaws in regard to uh, marriage and sexuality. We've had information out on that and hopefully you've been able to get that. If not, I think there are still some um, sheets available at the Welcome Center and that will be tonight at 6 p.m. Of course, uh, Jonathan has already told us that uh, with Palm Sunday today, this is the beginning of a very special week of remembering um, Jesus, our Savior. Um, on Friday, in fact, we have a Good Friday service. It's not listed in the bulletin, but I want you to be sure that you're aware of that. It's at 7 p.m. Friday evening. Always a very special time. And uh, I, I'm... Uh, really looking forward to it. It's going to be a little bit different this year. Every year we try to make it a little different in order to catch our attention in terms of really what it was for Jesus to, to um, willingly pay the price for our sins. And so that's this Friday, 7 p.m. And then uh, pray for uh, Saturday. We're going to have an Easter egg hunt as an outreach into our community, make connections with kids and families. Uh, information about that is in your bulletin as well. And then on Sunday morning, of course, Easter Sunday, uh, many times we have a lot of guests come on Easter Sunday morning. So I have a special request for you, which we've made other Easter's and Christmases. And that is, if you are a regular attender at 4C, would you please park across the street, that's across Randolph, at the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Um, not at St. Mark's. <laughs> They'll need their parking lot for Easter Sunday. But across the street, the Seventh-day Adventists, and we're going to provide shuttle service, um, which means also we need shuttle drivers for sur first service anyway, even showing up at 8 uh, a.m. starting our shuttle service. So we want to do this. We need to do this to be hospitable to our guests. Um, we don't want them to come, particularly those we've invited, find the parking lot full and said, oh, no place for me, and then they drive off. So whether you're in the choir even or a regular attender at 4C, if you could park across the street and shuttle drivers, contact Craig Riston. I know I'm taking a lot of time for this, but it's, we're preparing for Easter Sunday, a very special day. And so um, uh, if you could contact Craig Riston, his information is in the bulletin as well. We need shuttle drivers. 
Of course, there's the Easter sunrise service next Sunday morning, too. And again, details are in your bulletin. You know, for uh, about a month, I think it is, I've asked us to write out stories of how you have come to Christ and about your faith in Jesus. And my intent is to compile an anonymous, um, large story of who we are as a family, all by God's grace, to compile that huge story to celebrate what he's done for us and to give him the praise of his the gift of life that he has given us. So far, by the way, I've received 20 stories. It's not a novel, it's more of a short story so far, um, but it's a good start. Today, I would like you, right now, to hear one of those stories uh, from our 4C family. Because I want us to focus our thoughts and the rest of this morning on what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. What does that really mean? What does it mean to pursue him because he pursued you? What does it mean to recognize his voice and to be able to see how he has been with you all throughout your life? What does it mean to know him as your good shepherd and to boast about it? I'd like you to hear this testimony. Pursuit means to me the pursuing of or the going after of um, a person, an object, or a goal, um, obtaining that goal. And that's what God did for me. He obtained me. He pursued me until he got me. And then he continued to win me over. He didn't just stop there. And, uh, yeah, it was great. And it is. It's just a wonderful relationship. God's fingerprints has been on my life ever since I was a child. I can remember being in an automobile accident with my sister and my mom and seeing my mom's eyes closed and afraid that she was going to die. I remember being a teenager, young adult, going to the clubs and God's fingerprints was on me then too because I could have been harmed and I wasn't. I remember meeting my husband. Um, that's God's fingerprints on my life then, giving me a wonderful husband. And I can see God's fingerprints continually on my life as a married woman. We had uh, six, seven children, and our third-born son had passed away. And I see God's fingerprints there just protecting us through that tough time. And just recently, I see God's fingerprints still on my life. My husband was diagnosed with leukemia and a double diagnosis of his kidneys. And I just see God's fingerprints even then. As difficult as it is to see someone you love going through something like that, my husband never gave up on living life and loving his family and loving his children and his wife. So God's fingerprints, I see it. I look forward to seeing it. God has laid on my heart recently to completely trust him in all situations in life, especially with my husband's illness, feeling like I could lose my life mate and just be by myself raising our kids. So I just want to, I just need to trust him. I need to remember his truth. I need to remember his promises and to just live my faith genuinely in front of my kids. Just let them know that life's not perfect. It's going to be hard, but how we handle it, how we respond to it is where it's going to matter.
Oh, we're getting to know each other here. And it's a blessing to fellowship together and share special moments. I don't think it was much different for the children of Israel. They enjoyed sharing special moments together. And Passover time was certainly one of those special moments where memories came into play, traditions, things that were familiar to them. And one of the passages that was very familiar in the home of the Israelites, we find recorded for us in Psalm 118. And I would like to direct our attention to that passage for our scripture reading this morning. Psalm 118. We're going to read together verses 1, uh, yes, verses 1 and 2. And then we're going to jump over to the end of that chapter in uh, verse 19. You can read along with me, but absorb these words this morning. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this. It is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad in it. Lord, save us. O oh Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. For the Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. From the, with bows in hand, sorry, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Oh, just rest in that for a moment. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. The fact that they missed it, the fact that the people of Israel missed many of them, that God's goodness was reflected to them at the highest, in the highest way in the person of Jesus Christ, is a shame. But it doesn't change the fact that God is good and that his love endures forever. I don't know how many of us miss the good things that God is doing. Boy, it's pretty easy to stand 2,000 years back and point the finger, isn't it? But how many of us know that that is true? Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever, and yet the goodness that He brings to us rides right by. And we miss the significance of it. He is good. He leads us tenderly. And this morning as we worship him, we remember that this lamb was also our shepherd. Let me invite you to join with me in worship as we sing, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us.
Amen. You may be seated. Let's join together in prayer. Dear Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity to come before you and thank you and praise you for who you are. And Lord, I want to thank you right now that uh, you don't show us exactly what's going to happen to us in the next week, the next month, the next year. But you have shown us that you win in the end and that we, as children of God, will also uh, join with you. Lord, I, I can't imagine uh, on this Palm Sunday uh, many years ago when you knew what was going to happen in that upcoming week, uh, it became clear that uh, that weight did hit you as a human. And yet, Lord, you persevered and you uh, died for us and you rose again and you loved us so much and you proved it. Lord, I just uh, thank you for um, how you are a healer. And, and there are many, Lord, in our church that are sick. And uh, we ask for healing, Lord, uh, both physically, uh, emotionally, uh, but spiritually as well, Lord. Uh, there's a lot that we need to learn and grow. And so in those steps, as we're taking them day by day, Lord, help us to trust you and to remember that you love us, that you are with us at all times. Um, we just thank you, Lord, for walking with us. And as great and mighty as you are, you care about each of us. And so, Lord, this week, as we are preparing our hearts and minds for Good Friday and for Easter and the celebration that's to come, that uh, we just consider the work that you've done and remember uh, that uh, we too can just come before you and we can go to the Father and, and pray, uh, and he will hear us, and you hear us at all times. So thank you very much, Lord, in your name. Amen.
God often describes himself as a shepherd. And of course, that means people are sheep, right? I myself, <laughs> bah, yeah, <laughs> here you say that. I myself will tend my sheep and give them a place to lie down in peace, says the sovereign Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Leaders of Israel were also described as shepherds, both good and bad. And so, really, you know, it's no surprise that while we're traveling through John's gospel following Jesus, that we hear Jesus describe his relationship with his followers in terms of shepherd and sheep. On rocky pastures at night, when sheep needed to rest and be safe, they were often herded into walled enclosures that often backed up against a cliff or were at the end of a canyon. There were many caves throughout the, the hills of Palestine and shepherds would uh, pile up stones about waist high uh, around the, the front of those caves uh, in order to provide a safe pen and they'd close off the, the gap with um, thorny branches or the shepherd himself would lay across that entrance. It provided safety and protection for the sheep during the night. This is the background, in fact, for what Jesus says about his relationship with his followers. He says, I am the only way to safety in life. The description he gives, in fact, to the people around him is of uh, the sheep in that enclosed pen and he says anyone who tries to get into that pen any other way other than the gate, who tries to climb over the rock wall or descend from the back of the cave, is only there to harm the sheep. He's a thief. Because the shepherd will only enter through that gap, through that gate. And he's welcomed by the watchman, and the sheep recognize his voice. And, and so when the shepherd calls them to follow him, they do. They come out through that gate, that gap, and they find good pasture as they follow him. He says, they won't follow strangers, you see. In fact, they try to run away from someone whose voice they don't recognize. They only recognize the voice of their shepherd. Our family lived in the Willamette Valley of Oregon for some time. It's sheep country. In fact, we had um, a flock of sheep Behind our house, a flock in front of us, the one in front of us, I got to see the shepherd many times walk out among them, and it was always amazing to me. I, he would just walk out there, they'd kind of just naturally gather around him, he'd kind of have to nudge some of them aside as he was walking, but there was no fear there. And I was really getting into photography, and I thought, I want to get some pictures of this sheep particularly the little lambs, I see him out there. So one day, um, I went out into that field. The shepherd wasn't there, by the way. I went out in that field, and they ran. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted this cute little picture of, you know, a mama, a, a you, and, and the baby right next to it. I, I had all mapped out in my mind, but the closest I could get to any kind of picture was like this. <laughs> they were running away. Beautiful picture of running sheep. What's the point, though, of the story that Jesus told? What's he trying to say? Uh, in fact, the people around him, when he said these things, said, what's, what's this all about? I don't get it. Well, the point simply is this. It's his identity. He is the shepherd. He's the shepherd. He's the only way to safety and to life. Listen to what Jesus says as he explains his illustration. I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that they may have life 
and have it to the full. You know, this is happening. We're here on this bus trip through John's Gospel. It's happening at the same time, same place in Jerusalem as the healing of the blind man. In fact, it just happened, and now Jesus is saying this to the people around him. It's a continuation, because the point that we're starting to see here is that the blind man is the sheep who, who refuses to follow the voice of the Pharisees because he doesn't recognize them. But he recognizes Jesus' voice even though he was blind when he first heard that voice. And he follows. The religious leaders, you see, were supposed to care for the people and lead them to God. But they're exposed as thieves because they're really exploiting the people. They just want the honor and the praise, the applause that people can give them. And worst of all, you see, they did not lead the people through the gate, which was Jesus. So they're false shepherds. Jesus is the true shepherd, the only way to safety and to life. Did you hear the contrast to what Jesus said? He says, sheep who belong to the shepherd will not follow other shepherds. They can distinguish between the different voices that they hear. And my question to us today is, do we distinguish the different voices that we hear? Can we recognize, can we really recognize the right words from the wrong? The voice of Jesus versus others. See, others, as Jesus said, are going to end up bringing harm to the sheep, even death. But Jesus says he gives life and he gives it to the full. And so I also want to ask us today, would you say of yourself, ah, I am experiencing life to the full? Or like many of us, I have no idea really what you're talking about. It's a bold rebuke here of the religious establishment. <laughs> you're robbers, you're thieves. I'm sure that didn't go over well. See, the test of true leaders, he says, uh, is whether they say the same thing that Jesus says. And if not, their voice is different and will end up destroying the sheep. There's no safety, there's no protection there. You know, I am amazed and I am saddened by what some people who claim to follow Jesus say are the words of Jesus. They'll say things like, God wants you to be successful and wealthy. Even one of the tracks that were to bring people to faith in Jesus had been changed because it started off saying, how to have a happy and wonderful life. <laughs> but that's not really the heart of what Jesus says. You know, I hear some say that you can be saved without faith in Jesus because not everybody's heard about Jesus, so there's got to be other ways. That's not what Jesus says. I hear people say, God's a God of love. There's no hell, you know, the fire and brimstone kind anyway, that just people describe. That's not what Jesus says. I hear people say, even followers of Jesus, that if your marriage is bad, look for a better spouse. That's not what Jesus says. Who do you follow? Who do we follow? What voices do you recognize and pay attention to? Where do you go to find shelter? You know, we live today in a modern desert. Few things are off limits anymore. I'm surprised even in my lifetime how things have changed. There used to be fences and boundaries, but not anymore. You're free to explore, you're free, free to investigate, to, to dabble, to mix things that, whatever. You know, it's all wide open. Whose voice, which shepherd do we follow today? I know young parents feel like they need eyes in the back of their head even more for all the things that are enticing their children. But the fact is that many parents have already been enticed away. George Barna asked high school students 
Where would you turn first in times of tension, confusion, or crisis? This is what hundreds of high school students said. Oh, by the way, fathers were number 25 on the list. Mothers were number 11. So what's at the top? Where will they turn to? To music and to personal friends. I mean, just look at the model that we have on TV with all the sitcoms and, and, and shows. Where do apartment-dwelling singles go for answers? They go to their friends, to the bar, to the hangouts. You know, those with a lot of money, even as adults, it uh, doesn't matter what age you are, you go to a professional psychologist. Of course, even if you don't have money, that's okay, because anybody can go to Oprah. <laughs> but who goes to Jesus anymore? Do Christians in the church even have anything to say? Only. They only have something to say if they're saying the same words of Jesus and obeying everything he said. Otherwise, as Jesus the shepherd said, watch out. Harm, death, danger. Jesus is not just one voice among many, friends. He is, as Jesus himself said, I am not of this world. I am from above, and he is the creator of this world. So he is not just one voice among many. He is the voice that must be heard above all others. Real sheep recognize his voice and run from strange voices. But my question to us, most of us here today claim to be believers in Jesus. My question is, do we ever get tired of hearing Jesus' voice, or do we ever mistake other voices for Jesus? And the answer, I'm afraid, is yes. Believers who say, yeah, 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 I've heard all that before. Tell me something new. Why do we get tired of hearing Jesus Why do we listen to other voices? I think for many of us, it comes down to not experiencing the power and the presence of Jesus in our lives. Somehow we have gotten distracted. We lose sight of, of who he is. We stop trusting him. What I'm saying is, have there been times recently in your life where you have had to step out and do something even risky? To do something, maybe it's, maybe it's to trust him beyond the 11th hour and the 59th minute to come through to rescue you when you're in some danger. And you were able to say, it wasn't like I thought it was going to be. But his grace is sufficient. See, it's that kind of an experience with Jesus Christ that says, yes, he's the shepherd. Yes, he gives life to the full. It's when the, the voice of Jesus through his spirit says, I want you to tell that person about me. I want you to invite them. I want you to, to do something risky and show love to them. Or the voice of Jesus through his spirit says, as he does through his word, I want you to forgive that person. I know they don't deserve it. I know they've hurt you. I know they're probably going to do it again. But I want you to forgive them, and I want you to do more than that. I want you to pray for them, and I want you to show them love. And you do it. Because I suspect that when the voice of Jesus speaks, and we don't do it, a time comes, and it doesn't take very much time, where we start to look for and listen to other voices. Because Jesus' voice just isn't cutting it for us. Because we're not listening to it. We mistake other voices for His, perhaps because we spend so little time listening to His, in His Word. 
to say, I know what Jesus says in this situation. I know what he would tell me to do. I know what he's saying. I know your voice. What you're saying is not his because I've just spent time with him this morning and the day before and the day before and I know exactly what he sounds like and what he says. He's the only one who gives life to the full, you see. But more than that, Jesus said, I'm the gate. He not only gives life to the full, he keeps us safe from all threats. His eyes, yes, are, as it were, on the back of his head. He sees everything. Nobody can get past him, sneak in. Everyone who comes in belongs to him. He gives abundant pasture. Everything your soul and your life needs here we are in the desert. And he says, that's okay because I will give you the food and the water that you need for today, whatever it is. And tonight, I will protect you from predators and dangers. I know you're vulnerable. But the shepherd says, I know how to protect you. I know how to keep you fed. I know how to make you flourish and to be content. Because you see, it's the skill of the shepherd. Yahweh is my shepherd, and I can boast about that. But I ask, are you actually experiencing it right now, or not? Jesus says, I am the only one who truly cares. He says, I am the good shepherd. Now, that's not describing that he's morally upright, he keeps all the rules. He's not the good shepherd because he's, you know, this picture of a, a kindly man holding cuddly lambs. He's describing his commitment to the sheep. That's why he's good. He's in contrast to the hired hands who are only in it for the pay. You want to know what he means by good? Listen to his description of it. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. And then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus cares so much for you, his little lamb, that he is willing to stand between you and any threat. He is willing to die for his sheep. And at the same time, he is unwilling to even sacrifice even one of his sheep to satisfy the enemy. I mean, think about this. Normally, how this must have shocked people, because a shepherd might kill one of his sheep when he becomes hungry. Well, who would ever think of a shepherd dying for one of his sheep? <laughs> it's crazy. You say, oh, but they're so cute and cuddly. <laughs> I, could, I could see that. Oh, come on, let's get it straight here. Sheep are stupid and stubborn. I know it, I've seen them. More than that, the sheep represent you and me. <laughs> so what are we going to say to that? Romans 5, in fact, it says, you know, somebody might be willing to die, for, maybe, maybe, but rarely, for a righteous person. That means somebody who keeps the, the rules, a goody two-shoes, you know, kind of guy. Uh, okay, I guess if I have to. Uh, you might be more willing to die for a good person, somebody who has helped you out some time and has, has invested into your life. But you would never die for somebody who hates you you would never die for someone who wants to see you dead, an enemy. But the shepherd did. 
In fact, even as we sang this morning, <laughs> the shepherd became the lamb for you and me so that we could become his lamb. No matter how much we may twist us around at some point in our Christian lives even and think that we des somehow deserve that love and that's why he chose us and made us his. No matter how much we, you feel you deserve it, there's always going to be, I know in our minds, others that we know or think don't deserve it. Like Jewish disciples would say of Samaritans and Gentiles, they don't deserve it. You might say that about the person who slept with your wife. He doesn't deserve it. You might say it about the drunk driver who killed your little girl. Or the Iraqi who hates Christians. Or the guys who choose an alternate lifestyle. Or the corporate executive who lives only for more profit. Or for the parents who never showed love or for the bully, or the geek at school. They don't deserve it. Or for the whole host of people who surround us and don't even get a second thought from us because they're just background noise. But Jesus said, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. He's talking about the unexpected sheep that we, the current flock, may not recognize because they are outside and because they are different. But the shepherd says that they are equally loved and valued because he died for them. See, at the heart of what Jesus is saying is the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. It transcends all other relationships. It governs all of my life. It needs to govern all of your life. You see, the shepherd, with his whole life, he is committed to the sheep. And with our whole lives, we sheep are bound to him. And so I ask, are you, really, are you? Jesus says, only my sheep recognize my voice, recognize me and follow. Only my sheep recognize me and follow. You know, if you're going through John's Gospel, our picture of a, a, a bus trip. John, the driver, quickly says, all right, everybody back on the bus. Quick, 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 everybody back on the bus. Uh, we're going to take a quick trip here. And boy, he must have really floored that thing because in just a few seconds, we find ourselves two months further down the line here. It's now December. It's Hanukkah. And we're back in Jerusalem. And Jesus is there, again, among the people in Jerusalem. And he's about to give the ultimate statement of his identity to the people. There's a crowd that forms around him, a circle. And they are saying, are you the Messiah? Are you the Messiah? Tell us clearly. Tell us plainly. People are divided. We hear them. We're, we're confused in this crowd. Some say, well, would the true Messiah be any different? Wouldn't he do the miracles that this one does? Others are saying he's demon-possessed, he's raving mad. Some are saying, ah, he's not worth listening to. And Jesus says, what more could I say or do to prove it? Even if I gave you a direct answer, only my sheep would be able to understand what I say. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Because I and the Father are one. The gift of the shepherd, eternal life and eternal security, 
because he is of the same substance as the Father, God. Do you remember what he said earlier? We were in the crowd, we heard it. He said, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as, listen, he said, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. Can you say, to any kind of degree, I know Jesus as much as Jesus knows the Father? <laughs> See, isn't that an outlandish kind of statement? And yet Jesus says it so matter-of-factly. Because it's the relationship, he says, you have with me. Where you will know me, and I know you just like it is between the Father and me. <laughs> Unbelievable. I have a long way, long way to go. But Jesus says, you belong to me. It started. The pilot light is lit. In the Palestinian uprising in the late 1980s, Israel, the Israeli army decided to punish a particular village near Bethlehem for not paying taxes. The officer in command rounded up all the village animals, put them in a large barbed wire fence. And later in the week, a woman begged, could you please release my flock? My husband is dead. The animals are my only source of livelihood. Well, he pointed to the pen of animals, hundreds of them in there, and he just laughed. He said, woman, you think you can find yours in there? Ha! She said, please, may I try? And if I can, can I take them home? Oh, sure, yeah, right, okay, go ahead. And so he opened the gate, and the woman and her son stood in front of the gate, and he pulled out his little flute and started to play over and over a little tune. Suddenly, sheep heads started popping up all over the place. And the woman and her son turned and started to walk away, and 25 sheep followed. <laughs> they knew the voice, the sound. That's how it should be, because of our relationship to our shepherd. To be a good follower... We are often looking for something else that will satisfy. Greener grass. By the way, the grass is always greener over the septic tank. <laughs> We're looking for something that we think will satisfy us better than Jesus. We don't flee the voices. In fact, we get close to investigate it. That's what our culture says. Don't be intolerant. Don't be narrow-minded. Check it out. We become deaf to his voice because we're distracted or driven to get what we want. We doubt his care. In fact, he gives us a promise, and what we do, we stand back, we watch, and we critique him if he doesn't come through the way we thought he should. And then we begin to stray. We need to be honest, and we need to repent if that's what's been happening. If you haven't counted the risk, if you haven't stepped out in faith, if you haven't been spending time with him, confess it as sin, repent, because you have, you, not been listen, you have not been listening to the voice of your shepherd. Look what he has done for you. To know and to be known just like Jesus and the Father. Life to the full. Protected. He is always there. Always cares. Secure forever. Jesus says, I bought you with my own life. I will care for you. A satisfaction. I wonder, do people see in me, do people see in you a satisfaction that says, oh, I want that kind of shepherd? Choose to get close to him. Spend time with him. And maybe even the risky thing. Next week is Easter. I don't know who they are. You don't know who they are. But out there somewhere, even though they may be very different from you and me, there are other sheep that belong to this flock. And Jesus told us to go and to invite 
to call them to him. It's risky. But maybe that's what is going to have it's going to have to take for us to start to hear his voice even better, to do something risky like that. To step out there and to invite or to share Jesus with them. He told us to. So I'm asking even particularly next Sunday, let's just take a little step here. Invite someone to come next week. And maybe, maybe they will hear his voice. Watch this. I promise. It'll be full. It'll be full of people like me. Full of people who haven't been at church in a while. Full of people who think they might be critiqued or analyzed or judged unfairly. Full of people who don't have God in their lives and aren't exactly sure how to get Him back. But you know what? Before I step in, do something that's probably a big deal for you. You're going to see me this week, and I need you not to walk past me, and I need you to work through your fear, because I'm working through mine, and I just, I just need you to invite me in, and if I act like I'm not interested in going to church with you, still, I need you to ask me to come. I need you to help me see God. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. I need you more than you know. Because look, at the end of the day, God said he loved me enough to die for me. I mean, that is the claim, right? And if he died and he didn't stay dead, your church will be full this weekend. Your church could be full this weekend with people just like me. Different face, different skin color, different age, sex, or social status. But make no mistake, I could be sitting right next to you. I just need you to invite me in, that's all. Nothing more, nothing less. And nothing complicated. And nothing driven by guilt. Just invite me in. I need you to. I really do. to hear his voice. Whose voice was it that echoed the love of the Savior to you? In my life, it was a Sunday school teacher and then a choir, but it was very distinctly the voice of the Savior calling me. And he's calling you today to be that voice that calls out to the one who is wandering lost, and to be the one who says, you know, I love you. Come, hear my voice. You are mine.
who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way to my ever wandering heart? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. Still you hear me when I'm calling, Lord, you catch me when I'm falling. And you told me who I am. I am yours. Feel free to sing with us. Savior, Messiah of the world. Lord, we've cried out with the children and the people of Israel, Hosanna, Lord, save us, deliver us, give us success. And Lord, the success we ask for this morning is not the kind of success that the world seeks, but it's, Lord, the success of partnering with you, of being light in the darkness of adding salt and flavor to the bitterness of the world. Lord, we ask this week that you would help us to be your hands, your feet, your voice that proclaims you are a child of God and you are loved. Come celebrate with us. The King of Kings, the risen Lord, who brings life and hope and real joy. Lord, we know that churches all over our community, all over our country, all over the world will be reaching out in a special way this week. Lord, we ask that you would go before. Lord, in this time truly worthy of your honor, as you are lifted up, would you draw all men to you. 
hear our prayer, O oh Lord. For our good and for your glory, we ask it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful, holy week.